Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Lara or Lara Likes Mascara and today I'm gonna try not to do a big long intro. Let's just get right on into it. I'm gonna be talking about my controversial makeup opinions, part two. I actually <laughs> have a part one of this video unintentionally. When I recorded that, I didn't realize it was gonna be two parts, but each topic I brought up, I guess I was just like so heated about and had so many things to say that I only got through half of the things I wanted to talk about. So today we're filming part two. That first part, let me double check, but it was a while ago. It was like seven, eight months. So when I looked back at my original list of my controversial makeup opinions, I had thought, you know, maybe, maybe some of my opinions will change and I won't feel as strongly as I did about those things, but no, literally nothing has changed. And I stand behind all of these hot takes. Sorry, it's like eight months after the first video, but you guys seem to really love that video. It got a lot of comments, 85, which is like normally I get in the, in the 20 to 30 comment range. So, ooh, you had a lot of thoughts, but I loved it. I love hearing your opinions. So if you agree with me, let me know down below. If you disagree with me, also let me know. I love to have this kind of discussion, but without further ado, let's get into the video. So some of these things are like my personal beauty taste, makeup trends or, you know, colors or products that I like versus I don't like. And other things are more, a little bit broader than simple makeup preferences. And this is the same as in the last video. I will link it here if you are curious to watch part one, but I talked about products I don't like. <clears throat> lip gloss and I talked about my thoughts around the cruelty free label expiration dates. <laughs> I think expiration dates, whenever I talk about expired products, that is when people have a lot to say. But anyways, let's start off with my preferences around makeup because that's a little bit, a little easier and then we'll get into the more in-depth topics. Some of these are subject to change. Like I do wonder if these things are set in stone or if they will change depending on, you know, what the what the trends are and how my personal preferences change because they definitely have over the years. Like even though since I filmed that first video part one, eight months ago, my preferences haven't changed really. If we go back and look at my makeup in undergrad, my makeup, preferences have definitely changed since then. And I might actually include a picture from high school that I think is a very good indicator of, um, yeah, this overall change. So this first one I have talked about before at length, but it bears repeating. Curled eyelashes are a must for me. I will say, I don't think this necessarily applies to everyone. I know some people naturally have eyelashes that, you know, go more up than out. I'm not one of those people. Or that their lashes just naturally cold that curl all day, or they get curled when they apply mascara. But for me, that's not the case. And <laughs> I actually have a good example of this because I filmed one video last year where I did not have my eyelash curler with me. I had been staying at my sister's and I forgot it there. So for a full week, I didn't have an eyelash curler. It actually made me like, like tangibly sad. I don't think tangibly is the right word, but um, yeah, it sucked, especially for filming video. So I will link that here if you think, oh, you know, curling your eyelashes doesn't make any difference. Maybe you can't tell on me, but on myself, I need to curl my eyelashes. Look at them today. They look pretty great, right? I'm also using a mascara I really like. But yeah, they would not look that long and that full and that, you know, wide open if I didn't use an eyelash curler. So for myself, curled eyelashes are a must. And I also feel like I can tell with other people when they don't use an eyelash curler or they don't have one that works really well for their eye shape or whatever because you can just you can just tell by the kind of look that eyelashes have if an eyelash curler has been used and i don't feel like an eye makeup look is complete without it if you've got the liner the eyeshadow but then your lashes point straight and i feel like this is becoming more of a trend sorry i actually didn't realize that i would go on a tangent here but this is 
because of the more like natural makeup look that has become more popular lately, I feel like the full lash look is not as popular as it used to be, maybe. I mean, Kelly Gooch in particular has been talking about this lately, how she likes a more natural lash look. I just feel like overall eye looks are not quite as dramatic as they used to be, which is totally fine. But in my personal opinion, your makeup look is not complete if if you can't see your lashes, if they're not up and out like this. Yeah, when I'm looking at someone straight on and I can't see their lashes, but I can see, you know, their eyeliner and the rest of their nice makeup put together, I'm like, it's just, it's not complete to me. So that is my first hot take. Your makeup is not complete if you haven't curled your eyelashes. The next one, also eye related, and that is that if you're wearing eyeshadow, eyeliner is a must. A must. This is something that I realized fairly recently, like just within the past year. And I don't necessarily think that this goes for everyone. Maybe it depends on your eye shape or the color of eyeshadow you're using. But I think when I use eyeshadow, I tend to use like obvious eyeshadow. You know what I mean? I don't go for like a, a natural look most days. Some people might just use a little bit of brown or like a, a hair darker than their skin color. But as you can see <laughs> from myself, you know, it's a somewhat obvious look. I've got lots of sparkle on. This is actually my Project Pan eyeshadow. I don't know why it looks different today, but I feel like it looks way better than it usually does. But anyways, I've just found on myself, if I'm wearing a pretty heavy eyeshadow look, it does not look right if I'm not wearing eyeliner. And I think I discovered this because of YouTube. Like there'll be some times that I'm filming where I'm like, oh, you know, I should wear eyeshadow because it's YouTube. <laughs> I feel like it would be weird to film without eyeshadow on, but then I don't really feel like using an eyeliner or I use one that's like very, very light, like a light brown, and it just doesn't look right. It just, it's something about it, again, is not complete or I feel like my eyes don't look big enough or they're kind of tilting down and I like to sort of lift them up. So for me, if I'm wearing eyeshadow, I need to wear eyeliner. If I don't feel like wearing eyeliner, then I just won't wear eyeshadow. Like I feel like it's a better look to go with just mascara than mascara and eyeshadow. You know, like sometimes I'll feel, oh, I really like the look that I've got on. It's just a simple mascara and hmm, maybe I want to put a bit of eyeshadow on. And then I do that and I'm like, oh, this looks worse than it did when I was just wearing mascara because something about the eyeshadow elevates the look and then makes it look incomplete. For me, they, they just go hand in hand. And eyeliner does look good without eyeshadow, but not the other way around. No wonder that first video took me so long to film. I'm only two points in and I've been filming for so long already. Okay. The next thing, this is more of a trend, so I can see my opinion on this changing, but I felt this way for two to three years now, so it's been a while, and that is my preferred eyebrow look. Brows must be brushed up. I used to like the, you know, the brow look like this, but ever since fluffy brows became a thing, I don't like the very like, not straight, but like, hopefully you know what word I mean. Very like strict, confined brow look anymore. I need them to have more lift. I need them to be brushed up to look fuller. Otherwise, like when I look back at pictures of myself and I don't have them brushed up, I'm like, oh, it just, it looks so like cut off. You're closing your, your eyes off. Like it doesn't look open and lifted. I need to brush my brows up. A more legit YouTuber probably would have demonstrated all of these techniques and the differences and why they are superior. I am not such a YouTuber, but I will demonstrate the eyebrow brushing thing. So right now they're brushed up. I'm gonna brush them down. Oh, I hate this look. Look at this, look at this. <laughs> you guys, I look so funny. Uh, I think it's also because I draw my eyebrows on like a little bit, a little bit more arched than they are. I look good, right? Now let's brush them just like, like straight in place. So that's how I used to do it. Maybe, a, maybe a tiny bit more arched. Yeah, like that. That does not look right to me at all. It doesn't look lifted. I feel like my eyes are just like flat. So now look 
Look how much better that is. Can you see the difference? You might not be able to, but to me, it makes a world of difference. I probably should have got the brow gel to do this rather than just a little comb. But yeah, even though fluffy, fluffy brows are like not, I mean, they're not not in, but they're not as popular as they were back a couple years ago, they still have a chokehold on me. I need them to be a certain shape. Okay, <laughs> the next controversial opinion, and I think this is a pretty hot take. I feel like everyone is obsessed with multi-use products or even like the idea of them, the notion that you can use one product on your lips, your cheeks, and your eyes is just like, people love it. Even if they don't actually in practice use one product on all three things, they love to be able to use it on their cheeks and their lips. People are always suggesting, you know, use your lipstick as blush, vice versa. But for me, this does not work. And Sure, I have a couple of products that are multi-use, but I very rarely use them in those multi-use ways. I will always have a preferred way of using them. So I think I have one here, actually. I just did this on the weekend. I have a couple of these type of products. So I have, and even the Glossier. This is what made me think about it. But I have this and I have a couple of milk products that are cream blushes slash lip products. I really do not like them on the lips. This one at least is better because it's got much more pigment to it. So I can wear this on my lips. It is a little too bright pink for my preferences. Really nice cheek color as well. But I am just always gonna have one preferred way of using them and I think that it's always going to be manufactured for one way. Sure, you can use the milk makeup product. So this says lip and cheek. So theoretically, you can use this for both. And they seem to be saying that they have manufactured it so that it is equally apt for the cheeks and the lips, but I really don't think so. I think that when this was made, it was made primarily as a blush and as a benefit, it could also be used on the lips. I do not think that products can be made as having dual, like equally useful in two different types of ways because the different parts of your face just have different needs. Your cheeks are going to be pretty much like matte, I would say. Your eyelids are going to be very oily or very dry and your lips are going to be pretty matte, but interacting with stuff throughout the day. You're gonna be eating, you're gonna be drinking, you might be licking your lips. Like they just get a lot more action. So all of these different regions have different needs and it just doesn't make sense to me to have one product that is equally good at suiting all of those different zones of the face. And on top of that, I also have different color preferences for all of those things. So I'm okay with like a bright pink color on my cheeks, as I've said before, I do not like bright pink on my lips. So I just have different preferences for eyeshadow color, blush color, and lip color. If something suggests itself as a multi-use product, I'm automatically not going to be interested in it. I, If I already have them, then that's fine. I'll, I'll find a way to use it, which will be one of those ways. But if it seems to be specifically formulated to be multi-use and to use all over the place, that just, it just doesn't make sense to me. I have eyeshadows, I have blushes, I have lip products. I don't need something that's going to do all three. It might be convenient for traveling purposes or if you have one product in your bag and you need it to serve as a blush and a lip balm. But like, come on, how rare is that that you need to be bringing your blush around with you? You can always have a lip product and then a little blush like this if you need. It doesn't take up that much more space. So for me personally, I am a bit more of a makeup maximalist. I have lots of products. I'm not someone who only has, you know, 10 to 20 products. And so I need my products to be multi-use. Multi-use products don't, they don't give me the good vibes. Okay, this next one, I'm shocked that I didn't say it in the first one. Non-waterproof mascaras, not good. This is a little bit ironic because today I am actually wearing a non-waterproof mascara. It was gifted the Bad Gal Bang mascara and it's so good. <laughs> like my eyelashes look amazing. 
However, this definitely like smudges a bit if I'm out, my lashes will fall. So this is really only good if I'm like home all day. It's great for filming because I find it gives me great length and volume, but I know that I am going out later today and my lashes, I just accepted they're not going to look great. So this mascara can be, can be good. I think for like COVID times, it was great because people were not going out at all. But as soon as it's winter and you know, you're breathing, you're wearing a mask, you're gonna get mascara everywhere. Even if it's not like, you know, tears down your eyes, it is going to smudge. You're gonna find it right here. Waterproof mascara just relieves all of those problems. And I know people say like, oh, it's so much harder to get off at the end of the day. But for me, that is just, that doesn't even compare. Like I would rather have good mascara all day. I would rather my lashes look good for 12 hours or however long I'm wearing mascara, seeing people at an event and then have a little bit more trouble at night. Like it's not, it's not a worthy trade-off for me to have my eyelashes look worse just so that getting ready for bed can be a little bit easier. Do you know what I mean? Like to me that <laughs> that is not a trade-off that makes sense whatsoever. A sub part of this hot take is I do not mind going to bed with a little bit of mascara on. Not a problem for me. I will always wash my face before bed. I don't think I've gone to bed with my makeup on since like undergrad and it's not like I did that a lot but you know it would happen on the occasion but I always double cleanse before bed regardless of like what state I'm in before bed I always double cleanse but if I've got a bit of mascara on so what <laughs> like it really does not matter to me if I've got some mascara on I've never found that to be a problem and I don't really understand what the big deal is with having a bit of mascara on like then I just feel a bit better when I wake up because my eyelashes look better. And then when I'm getting ready for the day, the next day, I can just, you know, take that extra time and remove the mascara, or I can just build on top of it. Like, I don't have a problem with putting mascara on eyelashes that already have mascara on it from the day before. It might not look the best, but then I can just remove it if I want to, you know? Maybe this is the main, the main hot take that I leave mascara on at night sometimes. Not super often, but it happens and I don't see the big deal. Okay, so those are all of the like specific makeup related hot takes I have. The rest are a little bit more deep seated. So prepare yourself. And I just wanna say all of those things that I mentioned, I'm not trying to like target you if you don't curl your eyelashes, if you don't agree with my makeup preferences whatsoever. I'm not like telling you that you're doing your makeup wrong or you should change what you're doing. Do what makes you feel good. That's ultimately what makeup is about. Hopefully you're not doing it for other people, you're doing it for yourself. You're adhering to your own preferences. And that's amazing. If you can get to a point where you're doing your makeup entirely for yourself, like that's the goal, you know? The hot take that I was most excited to talk about is I think that beauty YouTube has kind of like corrupted my brain. Let me explain. <laughs> this is difficult to explain. I feel like social media has changed my brain and like the way that I perceive people's appearance. I don't mean in terms of like judging them as people really. It's more like I almost like expect people to look like how I see people looking on social media. So right now some of the trends in terms of hair, I feel like that's easiest to talk about is like crimped hair but like loose crimped like using a waver and then also like really blown out hair so sort of the big bangs and side bangs and then like the swoopy layers we've also got the very like slicked back hair look yes <laughs> the slick back hair look so like this like a ponytail got to make sure you've always got that part the claw clips those are in we still got like little braids in a little bit but now if i see someone wearing like a ponytail and you can't see their part or if it's like not super slick back i'm kind of like i don't know i'm like i i just expect people to all adhere to styles 
and like I force myself to adhere to them as well. So even though I have skinny jeans now, I'm like, oh, I, you know, skinny jeans aren't really in anymore. Can I wear them? And then in terms of makeup, you know, if people don't have their lashes curled, if they don't have the fluffy brows that has like the very nice arch or eyeliner, but it is like not a cat eye or it's very straight or it just cuts off right at the edge of the lash line, you know what I mean? Or if their eyeshadow is like not in the correct like beauty YouTube placement, then I'm just like, oh, that's not like good makeup. I feel like this is coming across as very catty and mean, but these are, this is like how my brain thinks now. And it's because this is what I see people look like the most. Like this is, this is my expectations now for appearance in terms of how people do their makeup. Like it's a very, it's the same, right? And that's not necessarily a good thing. I mean, within reason, people use different colors for eyeshadows and they play around with things, but there's still a very, like small template of what is acceptable for people to look like or what looks good in makeup and there shouldn't be rules in makeup people can do their eyeshadow and their eyeliner and their eyebrows however they want but because i have been watching people apply makeup in a certain style for over a decade now now i have certain expectations for what makeup should look like and again, I'm not saying this is a good thing. I think my brain has been corrupted by YouTube to judge people's makeup to these certain standards. I was just talking about this with my friend on the weekend. I've known her since grade two. We've been friends a very long time and she doesn't live in Toronto. So I probably only see her a handful of times a year, but she has never worn makeup. Like she, she experimented a little bit in high school, but since then she just like can't be bothered and you know, some, not everyone wears makeup. That's not that weird. But I was talking about high school. We were talking about what people looked like in high school and who's changed, who looks completely different, who looks exactly the same. And she was saying that I look exactly the same as I did in high school. And I was saying that's, that is absolutely not the case because, you know, I obviously feel like I've had a bit of a glow up since high school. I had no idea how to dress in high school. I had no idea how to do my makeup. And now when I look back on pictures from them, I cringe and I'm thinking like, why did my mom let me leave the house having like plucked off half my eyebrows? I mean, in like grade 11, I would pluck off my eyebrows to like here, like my eyebrows started here. It was so bad. It was so bad. And I showed her a picture and she's like, no, you look exactly the same. And I'm like, I, do I don't see, I don't understand how you see that. Like we, we're just we're just not seeing the same person. But I think it's because even though we're looking at the same picture, we have different standards. There's different things that we're looking for when we're we see a picture of someone. I'm looking for a certain like a certain way of like grooming yourself, a certain way of doing your eyebrows and you know your skincare and everything. And she just doesn't see that because she doesn't use makeup. She doesn't know what like looks good and what doesn't in the same way that I do because she hasn't had her her mind kind of warped that way. And again, I don't think it's a good thing. Like I hate that when I look at someone who doesn't have makeup that I deem to like be as flattering as it could be, I look at someone, I'm like, I wish I could do their makeup. I wish I could give them like a makeover because you know, we, I watch so many teen movies. I love teen movies and they're always doing makeovers. And like, I, I, I hate that. Like the feminist in me recognizes that we do not need makeovers and this is just a tool of like colonial and patriarchal control. But at the same time, I love makeup and I love makeovers. And so when I look at someone who doesn't wear makeup or who wears like bad makeup, I'm like, I want to have fun with this. I want to like fix this. I wouldn't use those words. Yeah, this friend just doesn't see that because she has not been inundated with the kind of content that I have been for over a decade. And I do worry about how that will change my perspective in the decades to come. I think it already has. I talked about this in my last video. You guys were so kind with your comments, by the way. Thank you so much. I just opened up about like my struggles with, you know, a little bit of self image and how YouTube and influencers have sort of made me more critical of myself and made me 
worry about whether I need Botox or plastic surgery. So I'll link that video here. But yeah, I do wonder if now, over the past decade, I've been influenced in terms of how I should apply my makeup. Will I be influenced in terms of how I need to get cosmetic procedures and injectables and keeping up with those kind of standards? Like over the course of my life, will it, will it affect my brain to a really, really negative degree? Will I be corrupted by social media? I really obviously don't want to be, but I think about that a lot, all the time. This is the one that I, again, I was most interested to talk about. I feel like there's a lot more I could say, but let me know your thoughts about that down below. Do you have certain, I guess, judgments around people's makeup? Or do you see everyone's like makeup style through the YouTube beauty lens? Y'all, I hate to say it, <laughs> but I think I need to do a part three. I'm so sorry. I've already been filming for over 31 minutes. I think because I just, that last point, I just had so much to say. I, maybe I should have saved that for like a separate video. Would you like to hear me talk more about the ways that YouTube and like being in this community and watching beautiful, perfect people all the time has changed my brain chemistry uh sounds dramatic that's probably not what it's done but it's changed the way that i look at people for sure anyways let me know if you would like to see a whole video on that but yeah i think i'm gonna have to wrap it up here i will do a part three one day because i still have more things that i have not talked about but i'm trying to keep my videos to a slightly shorter length because for a while they were getting so long so i'm trying to keep in the like 25 to 30 preferably like 20 to 30 minutes. But yeah, let's move on to the book that I've been reading lately. But this is The Fruitful City by Helena Moncrief. I don't know if I already knew this when I put it on hold, but this is by a Toronto author and she actually talks about all Canadian based locations, but for the most part, Toronto based locations. This is about the enduring power of the urban food forest. So I've been reading a lot about food lately, food systems, food security. And she basically talks about how we have lost our connection with making our own food. Animal Vegetable Junk, which I also read lately, was also an excellent book on food security and food systems, which was actually a lot better than this. But this is a very different type of text. She goes around different cities in Canada and she looks at how different not-for-profits and farms have grown and sort of integrated with urban landscapes. So even just within Toronto, there are so many fruit trees all over the city that we don't know about because we have lost our food literacy. We don't know what is safe to eat. If we saw a tree with like some berries on it, would you, would you pick the berries from it? Probably not because you don't know what kind of berries they are unless, you know, it's like blueberries and you're like, okay, I'm familiar with this, but blueberries don't grow on trees. I digress. This is really interesting because it did make me want to like get involved with those local communities now because I would love to gain a greater appreciation for how food is grown and locally because I am vegan. So I think a lot about food and I try to be more ethical about it, but I don't do any sort of work when it comes to like finding local food. That's just, I haven't progressed to that yet, but this, it would be really cool to, yeah, get in touch with the organizations in Toronto that are based around picking fruit and finding local food. I do live like right downtown in a small condo, so I cannot grow any of my own food, but it would be neat to do that, to have my own garden or, you know, fruit trees one day. So this wasn't great, the text itself, I don't really like the writing style, but how it made me sort of expand my thoughts and, and think about the future and what I want from food and what's possible in Toronto, that part was really cool. And I also wanted to say right before I started filming, I was watching the press conference for the Hot Docs Film Festival, which is one of my favorite film festivals, my favorite documentary festival here in Toronto. It is one of the biggest in the world. There's this doc that I was really, really hoping that they would screen this year because I've been looking forward to it for a bit and they're playing it for opening night and I'm so thrilled. I'm so excited to watch it because it pertains directly to my research. It is about food security somewhat. 
And yeah, so I'm gonna get to see it and I can write about it in my thesis. I'm actually working on my proposal right now. Like the timing is amazing. I'm so excited for it. I actually don't even remember what it is called. I think it's like doubly double colonized or something like that. It's about an Inuk lawyer. Twice colonized, there we go. If you guys have not watched Angry Inuk, one of the best documentaries I've ever seen. Okay, so that is it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know how many of these controversial opinions you agreed with, how many you disagreed with. Please keep in mind, these are opinions. These are not solid facts. I am not saying that you need an eyelash curler to look good or anything. This is just the way I feel about my own makeup style and preferences. So with all that being said, I will see you guys next time and have a great week.